Don't let anybody make you think that God chose America as his divine messianic force to be a sort of policeman of the whole world. God has a way of standing before the nations with judgment, and it seems that I can hear God saying to America, you are too arrogant. And if you don't change your ways, I will rise up and break the backbone of your power. Oh, tap. This is Femi, here with Freedom Now, and your ears are in tuned at high frequencies in a liberated zone. Freedom Now is a pan-Africanist, global news outlet from coast to coast, dispelling the Western propaganda media and their all-lies point of views. Freedom Now is devoted to relay true news, views and proper clues to form solutions around freedom for the oppressed worldwide. Now, get relaxed, grab a pen, and phone a friend, because Freedom Now is set to begin to awaken deep sleepers dreaming about Freedom Now within in Freedom Now in Habarigani, this is Sister Thage with Freedom Now's agenda for this Women's History Month Saturday, March 16, 2024. We commence with our sister, Luyanda Kuboka, in the African Drumbeat Historical Calendar. Then, prolific author, radical historian, professor of African American Studies at the University of Houston, and Freedom Now co-producer, Dr. Gerald Horn interviews. Dr. Danielle Teresa Williams, Associate Professor of History of the Global South at University of Leeds and author of the book, The Capital of Free Women, Race, Legitimacy, and Liberty in Colonial Mexico. And later in the hour, Dr. Horn interviews Dr. Butch Ware, Associate Professor of History at the University of California, Santa Barbara, and author of the book, The Walking Quran, Islamic Education, Embodied Knowledge, and History in West Africa. Our music clip mix includes MLK, Zat Mama, Prison Radio Commentaries from Umiya Bujamal, Charles Carpenter, and D'Angelo Betts, Ibei, Les Nubians, Baba Mal, Cheryl Bailey, Samara Joy, and more. So sit back, phone a friend, and as always, we stand ready for revolution. Chimerenga. This is Sister Luyanda Koboka with Freedom Now's calendar of historical events of heroes and sheroes for the week of March 14th. This weekly presentation is to honor and guide us in our continued struggle for liberation from the triforces of class, national, and gender oppression. March 14th, 1883. Karl Marx, the leading doctrinaire on the critique of capitalism and the inevitable contradiction between labor or the workers and capital or the capitalist dies. Karl Marx, the father of Marxism, one of the major components of revolutionary socialist ideology used to liberate Russian, Cuba, Vietnam, China, among more than 60 countries in the world, 
with its searing analysis of the fundamental anti-social essence of capitalism. March 15, 1961. The Bakongo clan of West Africa rise against the Portuguese and took control of northern Angola, though temporarily defeated with over 50,000 deaths and over 300,000 fled to the Congo. The freedom-loving warriors regrouped and inevitably organized under the leadership of the Movement for the Liberation of Angola and not only overthrew colonial government, but set in motion the overthrow of the dictatorship of Portugal and the rise of a socialist government inside Europe. March 17, 1966. Cesar Chavez and Dolores Huerta lead the first march to Sacramento by the National Farm Workers Association, which represented all farm workers, Africans in the United States, Haitians, though the dominant ethnic groupings were Mexicans. March 16, 1810. Africans in Oklahoma immigrate to Alberta, Canada as a stepping stone to repatriation to Africa. March 16, 1879. Huda Sharawi, a pioneer in the Egyptian women's rights and independence movement, was born. She was a leader in the anti-British colonial movement, realizing that the feudal practices of Egypt were kept stagnated by British colonialism. March 18, 1963. The French government tests atomic weapons in the Sahara on the first anniversary of the end of the Algerian War, where they were defeated. March 19, 1962. France was defeated after one of the bloodiest colonial wars in the history of humankind. Over one million Africans died in the successful war to free their homeland Algeria from the European capitalist pigs after spending decades in non-violent civil actions which further entrenched French colonialism. The organization of the National Liberation Front of Algeria provided the decisive organizational weapon for the destruction of French colonialism. March 20th, 1896. Ethiopia defeats the Italians at the Battle of Adowa, the only country in Africa that was never colonized. Europeans who at the Berlin Conference in 1884 to 1885 divided Africa for exploitation and enslavement on the basis of divine destiny and the notion that they were to Christianize Africa, though Ethiopia was the first Christian empire in the world. March 20th, 1890. Lawson, Native American sister who was a reconnaissance expert, skilled markswoman, healer, shaman, and emissary to Geronimo, honored Chiroquai Apache warrior, who was a leader in her people's struggle to survive in the face of white supremacy. She died as a captured prisoner of war in the United States fascist military barracks by torture. This has been Sister Luyanda with our revolutionary African drumbeat historical calendar here at KPFK 90.7 FM in Southern California, 98.7 FM in Santa Barbara, and streaming live on the World Wide Web, kpfk.org. Please check out Freedom Now's listing of over 35 prior programs at kpfk.org. We want to praise up our revolutionary ancestors who have made our present existence possible by hailing up the words of our Azanian sisters and brothers. Power to the people. Amandla. Away to. Amandla. Away to. Amandla. Away to. Amandla. Away to. Away to. <laughs>For KPFK Pacifica Radio, this is Gerald Horn for Freedom Now, and with me on the line is Danielle Tarasas williams Associate Professor of History of the Global South at the University of Leeds in the UK, author of the book, The Capital of Free Women, Race, Legitimacy, and Liberty in Colonial Mexico. Thank you for joining us on Freedom Now, KPFK Los Angeles, Professor Tarasas williams Thank you so much for having me. I appreciate the opportunity to talk about the book and the history of Black women in Mexico.
and we appreciate your joining us. So why did you write this book? I wrote this book because I wanted to highlight the accomplishments, the experiences, but also the challenges of free Black women in an earlier time period than what other books had focused on. I feel very influenced by um, amazing scholars from the U.S., um, focused on uh, U.S. Southern history um, in the 18th and 19th century, as well as scholars who focus on the Caribbean. And I was very much interested in being part of those conversations. And so I turned to Mexico because I felt like there was an opportunity to share an earlier history of Black women's contributions um, to uh, the legacy of the Americas. And so the capital of free women really highlights my investment in writing the history of people. It's very people-centered, so it's mobilized around the stories of um, women who were sometimes just one generation removed from slavery. Mm -hmm. And so you focus on the route from Veracruz to Mexico City centuries previously. And I take it that this was a center of the Black population in Mexico. I take it that the figures of Black people in that region are fragmentary. Is that correct? That's a really great description of it. So what we do know more broadly is that by around the mid 17th century, Mexico was home to more than about 150,000 people of African descent. That includes mostly enslaved people, but also free people. This demographic of 150,000 uh, people of African descent represents the second largest population of African descended people in the Western Hemisphere, second only to Brazil. Um, and so this is really an important part of the history of the African diaspora in the Western Hemisphere. And that's why I was so motivated to focus on Mexico. One of the things that I got from doing this research was how important this particular region was, the central Veracruz region, which was the site of the, um, of the landing of so many enslaved uh, Black people. And as they migrated out um, to parts of Mexico, perhaps more known to others like Mexico City or Puebla, as well as Oaxaca, um, a significant population stayed in the central Veracruz region, um, some because they were free and others because they were forced to work in sugarcane fields, in um, different maritime industries, working as muleteers in the transportation industry, and so the Royal Road, the Camino Real plays a really important, um, is really important context for people to understand the fact that black people were very much needed in transportation, but also areas of hospitality um, and forced labor in sugarcane fields that helped um, the, this demographic be a thriving, um, a thriving community. And, and one of the hearts certainly of the history of Black people in Mexico. Now, to what extent was Veracruz shaped by pan-Caribbean trends, especially Cuba, Jamaica, pre-revolutionary Haiti? That's one of the key things that I um, try to emphasize when I'm talking about the importance of this book is that Mexico serves as an excellent way to think about the ways in which um, experiences in places like Cuba, but also places like New Orleans um, and Jamaica, as well as um, San Domingue, later Haiti, uh, that there are earlier roots to many of the trends that we see later. And so perhaps most spectacularly, we have a sense of slave rebellions in all of these different places, right? The significance of enslaved people throwing off their chains, fighting back, creating communities, maroon communities, right? Perhaps best well known in places like Jamaica, um, where they have such rich documented history um, of maroon uh, communities and societies, these self-governing sites of former, formerly enslaved people. And so Mexico, uh, we do know that in the case of Mexico, that enslaved black people, as well as some free black people, were in Mexico as early as 1519 with Hernan Cortes as he lands um, in the central Veracruz region um, and he marches against the Aztec empire in Mexico City. We are also aware of the fact that there are 
people, um, enslaved and free Black people, who abandoned this march. And so there are Maroons in central Veracruz as early as the um, as, as early as the first encounter of Spaniards in Mexico. And so this is a rich, long legacy of enslaved people fighting for their freedom and really active resistance movements. And so one of the ties that I make with the later um, periods of places like Cuba and, and um, Haiti, as well as um, Jamaica, is that many of the um, strategies, many of the alliance, uh, many of the examples of alliance building that Black people underwent with um, other uh, indigenous communities, as well as with other free and enslaved Black communities, we see in places like Mexico in the 1500s and the 1600s. So part of what I'm trying to do is really say that the, the legacies that we're aware of for the 18th and 19th centuries, we need to pull that legacy back to at least the 16th century uh, to get a better sense of how Black people contributed to the Americas. Now, some of the Black women you write about in your book, The Capital of Free Women, owned enslaved Africans themselves. Do we have any idea of what percentage of enslavers in the region of Mexico that you study were actually Black women? We don't have exact numbers, but I would say generally it would be a very, very small percentage. But I do profile um, three Black women who own slaves in one of the chapters of my book. It is a very complicated history to understand. I try my best to really offer the reader an opportunity to think about the unthinkable, which is that some of these free Black women were just one generation removed. In fact, there is a separate chapter dedicated to a woman in Polonia de Rivas, and she talks about the fact that while she is a free mulata woman, that her mother was an enslaved Black woman who was born in Africa. And so these are not easy stories to make sense of. But I would say that for the most part, this is a very, very small demographic. And I highlight in the book the ways in which I think that the, some of the reasons they might have turned to um, this, this horrific institution. Some of those reasons include the fact that they are living in an area of Mexico where there is maroon activity. So perhaps owning slaves was a way to shield them from accusations of engaging with um, escaped slaves that they used it as a way to buffer themselves socially. One of the other reasons, of course, is that this is a profitable endeavor. And so I don't take that off the table, but also try to offer greater context for readers who are trying to make sense of the fact that these are Black women, they identify as Black women, they are identified in their documents as women of African descent, and yet they own enslaved people. The other thing that I tried to emphasize is that many of these women, because sometimes they're first generation in the Americas, that they don't see themselves as a collective unit, perhaps in the earlier years. Um, and so they don't see another enslaved, um, they don't see an enslaved Black person as perhaps part of their community because the person may not have been from um, the uh, ethnic background and the kingdoms that their families came from. Central Veracruz in the 16th century and the early part of the 17th century is an incredibly diverse area. I found nearly three dozen different ethnic as well as location and kingdom uh, designations for enslaved people being brought to the America or to Mexico specifically between 1580 and 1640. And so it could be possible that one of the reasons why that enslaved uh, free women are in, willing to be or open to being slave owners is because they don't see other people of African descent um, as belonging to the same community, right? So that's something that I've tried to highlight. Um, again, a number of different reasons as why I think that they turn to the institution of slavery. So the majority of three Black women in the region that you studied during the time period that you studied were servants, laundresses, food vendors. Uh, could you talk about their experiences for a moment or two? 
Absolutely. And so there are a couple of cases um, that I have been able to highlight of women who are not of the same level of capital um, of the, most of the women that I highlight. So a lot of the women that I focus on owned property, they owned slaves, they owned um, sometimes businesses, but there are women who I focus on who were um, cooks in basically what we would call um, inns or hotels of the time period. Those whose freedom was very much tenuous and we're not always sure how they were able to uh, earn their living. And so we, the, the book does try to offer a spectrum of women's experiences those who really did struggle uh, on very um, small salaries as they tried to, for example, earn enough money to buy the freedom of their children, to buy the freedom of their spouses, or to buy the freedom of their mothers. And so uh, a lot of these women are not going to be those who are the most wealthy. And so one of the things that I think about when I am focusing on women who were of lesser means, right? Lesser economic opportunities is the importance of their greater communities, right? Turning to family members, turning to intergenerational help, looking to religious communities of other free black people. And so this is a key part of what um, the Capital of Free Women underscores is that black women, regardless of their economic um, situations, right? Regardless of how much money they had, that they really depended on these significant members of their community, not all of them wealthy, but those who were willing to step in when the need arose. Now, there are various so-called socio-racial categories in Mexico, Parta, Mulata, Marena. The women that you study, how do they fit, if at all, into these categories? That's right. And so Mexico was um, under this sistema de castas or caste system in which there were different racial categories um, based on perceived or declared uh, racial admixtures. And so we see this great diversity of terminology being mobilized. And so the women that I focus on do represent many of the most commonly known um, uh, casta categories. And so there are women who are noted as negras, those who are noted as morenas, mulatas, and pardas. Now, the racial math of these categories is not always precise. So someone who's noted as a negra would be someone of just African ancestry. Someone noted as a morena would sometimes maybe have some um, different uh, background other than just African, but not always. Someone noted as a parda would be generally someone assumed to be of African and indigenous ancestry, and someone noted as a mulata would be someone of Spanish and African ancestry, according to general customs. Now, I did see that there were some issues in the archive, and so in the, about 150 years that I examined for this book, I saw that in the, for example, the notarial archives, a black woman would be noted as a parda, so someone who is of African and indigenous ancestry, but perhaps if she baptized her children um, in the local parish, they would note her down as a mulata. Um, similarly, I would see actually issues in the same type of archive, so an earlier document for uh, a free parda would be noted as a mulata or vice versa. And so Again, there's a lot of assumed racial math um, going on, but one of the things that I did notice across 150 years is that we see fewer women in the latter part of the 17th century noted as negra, um, both in um, ecclesiastical archives as well as in the notarial archives. But I'm not seeing, for example, differences in opportunities or treatments, for example, between women noted as pardas or as morenas or as mulatas. And so while there are different categories being mobilized, I didn't see differences in wealth distribution, op job opportunities, um, access to resources. And so I think it is sort of the messiness of these uh, quote unquote, uh, you know, categories that don't actually hold up as far as um, people's own backgrounds, but also probably how they were perceived in the world. So 
There are a lot of different categories. Those are the ones that I saw in the archives that I worked with, but I didn't get a great sense from the 150 years that I profiled that there were significant differences in life chances between Pardas Morenas um, and Mulatas. So how and when did slavery end in Mexico? So this is a hotly debated subject. Um, I would generally say around 1829, and this is again after um, the uh, this is after the start um, and really the end of the War of Independence in Mexico. And so, some people say that um, in 1810 there is movement around it as people are fighting against. Um, the, against the crown and, and wanting that independence away from Spain, that ideas about allowing and uh, you know free um, black people to be considered you know more part of sort of a body politic and therefore um, considering ending and abolishing slavery. The reality is is that by 1810 or even 1829 that Mexico was not solely dependent on slavery. Slavery still existed, and so I think that's an important way to clarify it, that while the vast majority of the economy and the vast majority of the labor force is not enslaved, that for those who were enslaved, those that time period in the early part of the 19th century really does matter as far as what discussions are being had. And so um, I would say that it, it begins as a movement um, after 1810, it builds and um, generally considered that the abol abolition is reached in 1829. But it's not something that, um, you know, Mexico is a very large country and it's a very diverse country, both geographically, culturally, economically. And so um, as it trickles down, right, we start seeing that the, there are still some strongholds of slavery. Um, that are affected. But the reality is that numerically, it's not going to affect as many people as, say, it might have in the earlier part of the 18th century or the 17th century. But slavery still existed, right? And so um, its ending, its full abolition does really matter to the history of Mexico. And I think many Mexicans are very proud that it was uh, one of the first in the Americas, in the Western Hemisphere, um, to abolish uh, this horrific institution. And so I think that's something that Mexico can be quite proud of. Finally, Professor Terrazas Williams, author of the book, The Capital of Free Women, Race, Legitimacy and Liberty in Colonial Mexico. What's next on your agenda? What do your loyal readers have to look forward to? Well, I look forward to focusing on emphasizing the importance of uh, with Black Women's History in Mexico. So I'm currently working on a shorter piece about Black women entrepreneurs in the 17th century. It's highlighted in my book, but I feel like there were so many stories that I didn't get have an opportunity to um, really examine and to highlight for, for everyone. I'm also working on a, another book that focuses on the history of the Catholic Church and its engagement with enslaved and free Black people in the 16th and 17th century. Um, anyone who knows the history of Mexico knows that the Catholic Church is an important institution. And so understanding the Catholic Church's role in both uh, figuring out how they were attending to free and enslaved back, black populations, what the status of um, uh, uh, black people's, uh, the status of black people would mean for mission work is something that I look forward to exploring more fully as I uh, work on the next book project. So black women entrepreneurs, and the history of the Catholic Church. Well, I'm afraid we're going to have to leave it there, Professor Tarasas Williams, author of the book, Capital of Free Women. Thank you for joining us on Freedom Now, KPFK, Los Angeles. This is Sister Flora, and you're listening to Freedom Now at KPFK 90.7 FM in occupied Mexico, including Los Angeles, 98.7 FM Santa Barbara, 93.7 FM in San Diego, and streaming live on the web at kpfk.org. Today's program, as well as 10 prior editions, can be reheard at kpfk.org slash audio archive, and scroll down to Freedom Now. From 12 to 1 p.m., following Freedom Now is her sister Asunta, with Spotlight Africa addressing issues facing Mother Africa. 
For a truly alternative international perspective on world affairs, check out RTTV Russia, CCTV China, and online at Presna, Latina Cuba Telesor Venezuela. News 24, South Africa, and Press TV, Iran. And now for our prison radio commentaries. Gwen gets a win. Daniel Gwen, a death row prisoner for almost 30 years, is now leaving death row and prison itself after his case was finally dismissed, after the case fell apart. For almost 30 years, Gwen was subject to decades of solitary confinement under threat of imminent death and soul-aching loneliness. Gwen's conviction stems from both a false confession and apparently tampering with witnesses by police and the prosecution. He was charged and convicted of murder, arson, and aggravated assault and the death of Marcia Smith of the 4500 block of Chestnut Street in West Philadelphia in November 1994. The woman died from smoke inhalation and several others were injured after jumping out of a three-story window. Gwen was charged with setting a fire. Why was the confession suspect? Because Gwen then in his 20s was a serious drug fiend his so-called confession was quite divergent from the facts at issue how did he survive almost 30 years on death row with his sanity intact art specifically he learned how to paint and he made stunning works of art when i was on death row at SCI Green, the prison aired shots of artworks on its closed circuit TV channel. I remember seeing a memorable painting of a jazz pianist deep into his music. The keyboard undulated like a wave, seemingly dancing to the music. That work of beauty was painted by Daniel Gwynn. Gwynn, now 54 years old, is now really free. With love, not fear, this is Mumia Abu Jamal. These commentaries are recorded by Prison Radio. Hi, this is Charles Carpenter. My CDC number is Victor08580. I'm currently housed at Chuck Wallace State Prison. This piece is called Take It All in Stride. I'm judged by a jury, none of which are my peers. And based on the fact that I'm black, I'm looking at multiple years. My social, my social standing is seldom a factor when deciding my case because we live in a country where fate is largely based upon race. I'm guilty until proven innocent. There's only one defense for me. No need to plead insanity. My plea is poverty. All things considered except actual facts, the book they threw at me is equivalent to an ax. I was told to keep my head up and take it all in stride and prepare myself mentally for the long prison ride. The world fused with isolation ignited by racism and violence, advised to pay attention to my surroundings and continue to move in silence. Trust is never an option. Be wary of those who offer you protection. Just remember this one thing, all warfare is based on deception. Fake hugs and handshakes and subtle seeds of jealousy. Listen for words of hate and deeds of infidelity. Keep this all in mind and don't carry yourself like a rookie. Trust no one. Please believe that the haters will hate on you for something as small as an extra cookie. There's no escaping this harsh reality and you can't run and hide. So stay strong and keep your head up and take it all in stride. This is Charles Carpenter signing off. These commentaries are recorded by Prison Radio. The Gans Low Best again, 265332. Miss you, Department of Correction. I'm mean, on your maximum right now. And uh, still in segregation. Been in segregation in November 2022. And uh, continue to, uh, to use my mental illness, bipolar one, disorder, as a handicap and use me. You keep me in these programs. It's not even progressing. You know what I'm saying? So 
you know what I'm saying, this, this, you know, segregation, they're using, you know, clandestine reasons to keep certain guys in segregation. I guess my file warrants, even though I haven't had no staff assaults in almost 13 years, they still continue to use my file against me and keep me in the hole. Anyway, so I want everybody to know that, like, it's not just so much about what we're doing right now, so much what they got, I, they, 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 you know, what they're doing to me and using my mental illness and my diagnosis, my legitimate diagnosis. I, all I do is take medication. I get no recreation. Can't get no, no, no nothing else, else. No phone call but once a week. So I'm calling right now, you know what I'm saying? It's still open to my door. You know what I'm saying? They can just, somebody can just hear me out there, say it to the ombudsman, or they can ask a little best, number 265332. You know, I'm in Ionia, I'm currently located in Ionia, Maxwell, in Ionia, Michigan, you know? Maxwell, I'm down 24 hours a day. These commentaries are recorded by Prison Radio. We will now continue with historian professor Dr. Gerald Horn. For Pacifica Radio, KPFK Los Angeles, this is Gerald Horn. And with me on the line is Butch Ware, associate professor of history at the University of California, Santa Barbara, author of the book, The Walking Quran, Islamic Education, Embodied Knowledge and History in West Africa, and Jihad of the Pen, the Sufi literature of West Africa. Welcome to Freedom Now, KPFK Los Angeles, Butch Ware. Appreciate the invitation. I'm glad to be on with you. And we're glad to have you. So why did you write this book, Jihad of the Pen? Uh, Jihad of the Pen um, came from a collaboration with the first two PhD students I trained. Um, they're both now professors, Zachary Wright at University of uh, Northwestern University, Qatar campus, and Amir Saeed, who teaches at the University of Virginia. They were my two, first two PhD students. And basically, we, we had lengthy conversations about letting some of the great West African Muslim Sufi scholars speak for themselves. As academics, we're often, um, you know, kind of translating their works um, and, you know, communicating their ideas, whether through interviews like this one or in academic publications. And this particular um, uh, piece is publications, translations of West African scholars in their own words. And some of the most like uh, profound, formative intellectual figures of West African history from the late 1700s right down to the end of the 20th century. Um, so we brought them together in one volume so that people that aren't familiar with the tradition would learn like what the, the relationship is between spirituality and social justice in African Islam. So explain to our audience the concept of jihad, which has received the kind of negative press on this side of the Atlantic. Yeah, absolutely. So the 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 way that I would introduce this is through a work of another one of my um, brilliant colleagues, uh, Sheikh Anta Babu, teaches at the University of Pennsylvania. Um, he wrote a book on one of the great West African Muslim uh, Sufi scholars, Sheikh Ahmed Ubamba, and he called it Fighting the Greater Jihad. Um, and the reason for this is that there's a narration that comes in the Islamic tradition where the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, is returning with his companions from a battle essentially to assure the survival of the Muslim community. It's the Battle of Badr. 313 are standing against a thousand that come from Mecca to try to exterminate this community in its entirety. And after having survived this battle, um, the Prophet turns to one of his companions and says, we now return from the lesser jihad, the lesser struggle, to the greater jihad. <laughs> and you can imagine this man who's like covered with, you know, his own blood and sweat that's standing next to the, the Prophet is thinking, what could be a greater struggle than what we just went through? And the Prophet responds to him, it is the struggle against your ego and your passions. In other words, the inner struggle, the spiritual struggle, the struggle for um, inner enlightenment um, and character development is ultimately a greater struggle than any military struggle, um, any struggle that could take place in the world. So that that's the, the real uh, greater jihad, that's the true jihad. Um, and for many of the West African uh, scholars, um, some of them translated in the volume, it's the only jihad that is still permissible under uh, contemporary circumstances, except for self-defense. So why Sufi? Islam and not Sunni or Shia Islam as a force in West Africa. I guess yeah. what were they distinguished 
And to what extent is Sufi Islam a major trend as Islamic in West Africa? Yeah, so it's so the, the first thing just to, to, to sort of clarify, um, Sufi isn't a sectarian di division or distinction the same way that Sunni and Shia is. Those have to do with disagreements over um, particular matters of doctrine and creed and also elements of political history that divided Muslims um, from you know the early years of Islam right down to the present. Um, Sufism, properly speaking, and people you know that 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 engage in like the 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 spiritual journey um, of Sufism, will oftentimes not be willing to like identify themselves as Sufi because it almost sounds like boasting. But what Sufism is traditionally, it is the discipline within the Islamic religious sciences that focuses on character development and spiritual um, uh, uh, realization, um, essentially. So most people that are Sufis think of themselves also either as Sunni or Shia, um, you know, depending on, you know, kind of which uh, sectarian community they, they, they belong to. Um, with respect to its significance in West Africa, the short way that I can answer this question is just to say Pew Research Center um, did polling of different parts of the Muslim world um, about 10 years ago. And the top 10 countries in the world for Sufi self-identification are all in West Africa. So West Africa is the Sufiest place on earth. Mm -hmm. um, in Senegal, 92% of the population, the Muslim population, um, associate themselves with the Sufi order. 55% um, in Chad, 37% in Nigeria, 30% in Mali, and so forth. It, you have to go to, um, you know, like 11 or 12 on the list to get out of West Africa at all. And that's like Bangladesh at like 19%, 20%. Um, so all of that is just to say that in West Africa, this ap approach to um, character training and spiritual realization is still very much the core of Islamic religious practice and identity. And the last thing that I'll say about that, to be brief, is that that kind of proportion, that attention to Sufism that you find in West Africa used to be much more widely spread in the Muslim world. It used to be ubiquitous. Um, and essentially, a bunch of things happened with colonialism and the rise of the Saudi state at the uh, early years of the 20th century that starts to give Sufism a bad name in some parts of the Muslim world. Um, and Sufism tends to be abandoned, but West Africans hang on to it. Um, with both hands. Um, so that's also part of the reason why we did this uh, this book was that people have a lot of misconceptions about Sufism, don't really know what it is. Um, and it was great to let um, some West African uh, brilliant scholars speak in their own words. And then of course, I also wrote an analytical essay concluding um, the volume um, and my colleague and friend Zachary Wright wrote an introductory essay. So there's some, some good academic analysis in there too. So you speak of an Islamic revival in West Africa in the 19th and 20th centuries. Did the rise of European colonialism and or the transatlantic slave trade shape this trend? Very much so. Um, and in ways that are, you know, sort of um, uh, maybe surprising to some. Um, so the first thing that I would say about that is that you asked about the 19th and 20th century. I'll respond to that first. I just got done talking to my undergrads about this, is that one of the most paradoxical outcomes of European imperialism in West Africa is that Islam spreads more rapidly in the century of formal colonization between, you know, the 1850s and 18, or, uh, sorry, the 1850s and 1960s in West Africa than it had spread in the previous two centuries before that. So European imperialism very is very anti-Islamic, especially the French version of it, and much of Muslim Africa is colonized by the French. And nonetheless, um, many of these brilliant uh, scholars and teachers and community builders are able to, to, to use the infrastructure of the colonial state against the colonizers. They spread out with um, uh, Sufi schools along rail lines that were really just designed for resource extraction and exploitation. Um, and instead they use the spine of this colonial infrastructure um, to spread um, uh, West African Muslim teachings to new populations that they hadn't reached before. So it's a it's a it's a means of cultural resistance to colonization during the period of European um, imperialism. In the era before that, the era of the Atlantic slave trade, and this is something that I'm working on in, in uh, writing about in an upcoming book, and I wrote a little bit about it in the Walking Quran as well. In the era of the Atlantic slave trade, Sufi Muslim scholars 
organized the principal forms of resistance to the Atlantic slave trade in West Africa. They fought entire revolutionary movements. One, a person called Abdul Qadir Khan, a Qadri Sufi, literally leads an anti-slavery rebellion in the 1770s in the Senegal River Valley that abolishes monarchy, it abolishes the institution of slavery. Um, and so one of the things that I'm always trying to bring forward, especially when teaching to our people, is that African Muslims, remember, African Muslims made between made up between 15 and 25 percent of the black people that were brought in bondage to the new world. So this is, as black folk, a significant portion of our ancestral legacy. And moreover, um, African Muslims pioneered resistance to white supremacy in West Africa before even being brought here. Um, so it's very, very important for like, you know, this is Freedom Radio, right? If we're talking about getting free and we have, you know, um, our African Muslim ancestors that pioneered this work, that struggled against the Atlantic slave trade, abolished the institution of slavery, resisted um, in military form imperialism in West Africa, and then when they were no longer able to do so, did not submit, did not accept defeat, even under circumstances of colonial domination, they, they found ways of extending um, their their culture both in geographic reach and in depth so all of that is to say we don't have to reinvent the wheel we can reconnect um with uh with our ancestral ancestral traditions now you just alluded to this but perhaps you could expand upon it you're sure. on a book the first atlantic revolution islam abolition and republic in west africa circa 1776 could you sketch for our audience what this future book entails? Man, so this this book, it comes out of my first book that you mentioned, The Walking Quran, um, Islamic Education, Embodied Knowledge, and History in West Africa. So um, listeners that get the chance to, to pull that um, you know book from a shelf uh, somewhere, um, turn straight to chapter three, and you'll read uh, the chapter called The Book in Chains, which is about... Um, anti-slavery movements um, in West Africa that were organized by Muslim scholars. And there's one particular movement um, between 1770 and 1806, which was literally bursting out of the seams of my first book. I had to cut about twice as much material as eventually went in um, to that chapter. So I've been writing a book length treatment of this anti-slavery revolution in the Senegal River Valley, which is by the way widely acknowledged by um, European scholars um, in that time period. So just one quick example, the founder of the London Society for the Abolition of the Tra Slave Trade, the Reverend Thomas Clarkson. Um, Thomas Clarkson is the person who teaches abolitionism to William Wilberforce, who is usually credited as being the founder of abolitionism. But in point of fact, Clarkson was the founder of the London Society for the Abolition of the Slave Trade. So Clarkson's first book, Letters on the Slave Trade, he devotes 25% of the word count in that volume to describing an anti-slavery movement led by Abdul Qadir Khan in the Senegal River Valley. And he says that this wise and virtuous imam has done more than any of the sovereigns of Europe for the causes of liberty, humanity, justice, and religion. And he goes into detail after having interviewed slave ship captains that went to the Senegal River Valley and surrounding regions to carefully document an anti-slavery movement led by black Muslims in the 1770s. And this is such an important story that is hidden and concealed from our people because it's often represented that Africans participated in willing fashion in the slave trade. Whereas in point of fact, Africans resisted at every point along the way. Clarkson on this point says that the sum and uh, substance of Africa, of European involvement in Africa during the era of the slave trade is efforts, uh, schemes of bribery and inter intoxication to transform African kings from uh, shepherds to wolves amongst their people. And so then he tells this story um, and it's corroborated by many, many other sources of one of the many African resistance movements that was successful at least for a 30 year period in actually uprooting not only the slave trade but slavery itself from a West African society. Last thing that I'll say about this is that it's the first Atlantic revolution because 
it's about the same things that the American Revolution is about. It's about new stakes of liberty for humanity, right? But the, these West Africans don't sell out with three fifths of a human being for some people, right? They they abolish the institution in its entirety. They abolish monarchy and establish a Republican form of government. So why is this story, which was widely known in its time, not told alongside the age of revolutions when we talk about the American Revolution, the French Revolution, and grudgingly in the recent past, we brought the Haitian Revolution into that conversation, this Senegambian Revolution preceded it, and it also funneled directly into it, because now I've been able to follow some of the, the uh, enslaved lieutenants that fought next to Abdul Qadir Khan against the slave trade in West Africa. When they lose battles, they're sold to places like Antigua, where they foment slave rebellions. They're sold to uh, Saint-Domingue um, and participate in the Haitian Revolution. I've even been able to find one brother that is fighting alongside Abdul Qadir Khan in the 1790s and then fighting alongside Toussaint Louverture um, in the early 1800s. So this is an important part of our story here um, as Africans in the diaspora as well, is that this was a revolution that traveled throughout the Atlantic world through slave barracks, not just through the drawing rooms of London abolitionists. Now, if you don't mind, Professor Ware, I'd like to return to a point you mentioned a few moments ago. You said- Please do that the decline of Sufi Islam may have had something to do with the Saudis, I think I heard you say. Yes. Could you Correct. elaborate upon that? Yeah, so in my first book, in, in the fifth chapter of my first book, The Walking Quran, I just explained how, well, a, a lot of things people don't understand about the, the Saudi regime. The First of all, the Saudi regime comes to power in the early years of the 20th century with help from British imperialism. Like there's been a lot of, um, you know, uh, Palestinian liberation activism that has been pointing to the colonial origins of, you know, the Zionist state of Israel. A lot of people don't realize that the same UK imperial forces that, you know, handed turf um, to the Zionists were responsible for the establishment of the Saudi state. Um, so that's the first thing to just say is that the Saudi state is very much, an, it's born as an imperial um, entity and the, it serves UK imperial interests throughout the 20s, 30s. Um, the movie Lawrence of Arabia is actually principally about that. It's about um, the British establishment of the Saudi uh, state. So um, one of the, the doctrinal positions that the Saudis hold is that Sufism is a blameworthy innovation and that anybody that that uh, follows Sufi ideas or doctrines has made themselves a heretic according to their interpretation of Islam. And part of how they took power was that by making such people Sufis heretics according to their understanding of Islamic law, they then concluded that these people had gone outside the fold of Islam and it was legal to make war against them, kill them and take their lands. And that's how they took over the western part of the Arabian Peninsula was by making war on traditional understandings of Islam and traditional understandings of the place of Sufism within the religious sciences of Islam. Um, so very, it's been very much the case that over the last hundred years, especially after the discovery of petroleum in Saudi Arabia, that the Saudi state has been able to promote its own particular idiosyncratic version and vision of Islam as normative because they are in possession of the holy cities of Mecca and Medina, which hold such important spiritual and symbolic uh, significance for Muslims. And a lot of Muslims don't know the history of how the Saudis got there and the fact that their own sect was perceived as heretical as recently as the middle years of the 20th century. Um, and that it was actually oil money that essentially purchased um, a veneer of legitimacy for, for that state. Um, so even some of the scholars that we translate in Jihad of the Pen come from traditions. I mentioned the Qadri Sufi tradition of Abdul Qadir Khan. One of the great Qadri scholars of the late 18th century says, as long as the Wahhabis, the, the, the religious sect um, that, that the Saudis belong to, as long as the Wahhabis are in uh, possession of Mecca and Medina, pilgrimage isn't required of Muslims. Oh, like that, that, is how, that is how outside the fold they were understood to be from the standpoint of traditional Islam um, you know, in earlier eras. So, Professor Ware, how did you get involved in this vein of scholarship? You know, the the the, the short answer to that question um, is that as as a 19 year old, um, I read Sheikh Anta Job, African Origin of Civilization, Myth or Reality. 
um, and was introduced to like African history for the first time in my life um, and an Afrocentric approach to African history. And I was literally playing minor league baseball at that time, riding on a long bus ride, reading this book. And as soon as I got like 30 pages in, I was like, I'm going back to school. Um, and I knew that I wanted to study African history because this was the thing that I was going to be passionate about. And I followed Sheikh Anta Job's footsteps, went to Senegal, where he's from. You know, Sheikh Anta Job, you know, widely recognized to be the founder of modern Afrocentric um, uh, thought and scholarship. A lot of people don't realize he was a practicing Sufi Muslim, one of the followers of Sheikh Ahmed Bamba, who I mentioned before, who's one of the scholars that we translate in Jihad of the Pen. And long story short, I got interested specifically in Sufism through my research in Senegal, through living in Senegal, learning to speak the Wolof language fluently. One of my daughters was born um, while we were living um, in, in Senegal. Um, so I developed a very deep and close connection, you know, with the culture of the place and really relearned um, Islamic spirituality through um, West African teachers. I, I converted to Islam myself when I was 15 after reading the autobiography of Malcolm X. So Islam meant something to me personally, but I hadn't really been introduced to the African expression of it. Um, and I've been trying to live in service of both, you know, African and diasporic emancipatory understandings of black history and Islamic history ever since. Uh, briefly, infielder, outfielder, catcher, pitcher. Pitcher, um, and, and, and also played a little first base. So, you know, I threw hard and hit bombs. I was throwing like 90, 91 miles an hour. Um, by the time I was 17, 18 years old, I played at George Washington University um, as an undergraduate. We were A-10 champs. Um, my freshman year, um, and I found out when I was in school that I was better at school than baseball. Um, but I still, you know, uh, you know, I, I can't. You know, but I think I was part of the last generation of you know black folks who who grew up with baseball as the number one sport still, um, before basketball took over. Finally, Professor Ware, Associate Professor of History, University of California, Santa Barbara, author of the Walking Quran, and for our purposes today, Jihad of the Pen the Sufi literature of West Africa. Finally, would you recommend UCSB as a site for study by younger, for younger scholars? Without any question, um, I, I would say two things. Um, I talked a little bit about like the, the, the black diasporic um, emancipatory tradition. For years, um, Cedric Robinson here at UCSB, you know, God rest his soul, um, you know, uh, author of multiple works on the black radical tradition really set the standard in terms of like uh, uh, deep scholarly analysis of black revolutionary thought um, and you know folk like me are farming in the field that he cleared um, i would add um, that you know since i came here uh, five years ago i've been directing a center called the initiative for the study of race religion and revolution which tries to bring together um, un um, understandings um, you know particularly um, african-centered understandings of spirituality um, and social justice so we've had you know amazing um, collaborations with you know artists activists academics um, practitioners of traditional african religion muslim scholars um, that are all about uh, getting folks folks free internally, um, you know, and externally, um, fighting against the oppressors um, inside our own hearts and souls, um, and fighting against the oppressors in the world. So, uh, so definitely, you know, come check us out. Well, Professor Ware, I'm afraid we're gonna have to leave it there, author of the book, Jihad of the Pen, the Sufi Literature of West Africa. Thank you for joining us on Freedom Now, KPFK, Los Angeles. It's been a pleasure. And in closing, we'd like to thank our guest, Dr. Danielle Terasa Williams. Thank you, Dr. Butch Ware. Thank you to our producers, Dr. Gerald Horn, Sister Flora, Sister Femi, Brother Brandon, our board op Wendell. Thank you, Mark Maxwell, and all those who made today's program possible. This program, as well as prior programs, can be reheard for the next 60 days. You can go to kpfk.org, audio archives, scroll to Freedom Now. Stay tuned for our sister Sumta coming up next with Spotlight Africa, addressing issues facing Mother Africa. And signing off for Freedom Now, this is Sister Thage. And until next week, as always, we stand ready for revolution. <laughs>